I don't remember much about my first backpacking trip in my 20s, but I do remember a couple of things. One was I packed an iron skillet, and uh, the other one was we hitchhiked back. That's the parable. Let's look at the scripture now. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, could be translated, disregarded the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So we heard that, that the uh, runners in, uh, in the ancient times, that they stripped themselves of just about everything they could. They laid aside every weight, every hindrance. The, um, that word for weight looks close to our word for anchor. So there are, there are various things that could hinder us. And And you're right, I can barely see you out there. There are various things that hinder us. One of those, which may be a great spiritual danger for us, is the the, uh, cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, possessions, things. And we want to lay aside as much as we can so that, that uh, we carry with us only, only what is, is necessary, only what will be helpful to us, and lay aside the rest. And in this passage, we lay, we lay things aside, we strip things off, and look to Jesus in uh, Colossians chapter 3 in Colossians chapter 3 verse 2 we set our minds on the things that are above and then we lay aside things we put to death some things we We put off, we take off other things. And my first point is that, that both the laying aside, the taking off, and looking to the Lord Jesus, it, it seems we can't have, it seems like these both work together. They, they reinforce each other. So... So uh, uh, laying things aside makes room for us to look to the Lord. But uh, 
I think of that I think of that hymn that talks about not the stripping of our idols with its bitter void and smart. That can just be painful. And who wants to do that? But if we look to the Lord, it becomes easier. And that's what we have in Philippians 3. Philippians 3, verse 7. Um, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. All those things that were, that were humanly speaking, advantages for Paul... All those things that look good, if, if he had a resume, it would look good on it. But uh, he says, he says in verse 8, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. But I don't think he regarded it as loss. He, he just, he regarded it as, as rubbish. And the word is actually stronger than that. I, and there would be very implied ways to say that word. But it would be, it would be dung. It would be, it would be only fit to cast to the dogs. If, if that. Because he had found something so much better. He says, in that, uh, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which comes through faith in Christ. So, so my first point was the putting away, the stripping off, and the looking to Christ may occur in either order. Either one may come first and they reinforce each other. My second point is that we may feel our little gatherings, at least two or three, but we may feel like there's nothing here to draw people in. There's no attraction. Even the least meeting represented here has, has a surpassing attraction. In 79, I stumbled into Grove City I had heard from Dan about how they meet, and it sounded a little weird. Uh, and, I, and I even went to a, a Wednesday night Bible study. Maybe it was Thursday night back at that time. But, and I thought, hmm, dry as dust. But uh, Sunday morning at Grove City was the first time I encountered remembering the Lord. And I was blown away. It wasn't just that there were hundreds of people singing a cappella, which was beautiful enough. But they sang, Thou art the everlasting word, the Father's only Son. I said, what? what's going on here? We're not singing about how happy I am. We're talking. We're talking to God. Nothing about us. 
It's only about him. Oh, that is the, that is the, let me find the verse. The surpassing value of the Lord Jesus. And if we can encourage others, bring them in, not to bring them to ourselves, but to bring them to him. If possible, to help them to see him. I'm, I'm, I'm hardened by this verse lower down, which was in our portion this morning. Verse 15 talks about those who are mature. And if somebody thinks otherwise, and perhaps you might think you're not mature enough. But listen to this part. God will reveal that also to you. And I'm, I'm not sure of the exact thing Paul was getting at here in this uh, context, but we can certainly apply it that God delights to reveal to us his son. In fact, in fact, there's a divine person who's dedicated to that job. And he will do it. Furthermore, in coming ages, let's look at that verse uh, and, then I'm, and then I'm done. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2 verse 7 So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus.
only three or four verses. I think it's Habakkuk 2, the prophet Habakkuk, chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will look forth to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer as to my reproof. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and engrave it in upon tablets that he may run that he reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time but it hastes to the end and shall not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, for it will surely come, it will not delay. So far the word of God. Just some very practical remarks. Because the situation of Habakkuk is a situation which we all know in our daily life. He has two very important questions. You find these in chapter 1 in the first verses. And the first question is how long? And the second question in verse 3 is why? Of course, this is a special situation here in the book of Habakkuk because he saw the problems under the people of God. But I don't want to speak about this. I only want to speak about the situation that we have these questions in our life. That could be because of illness. That could be because of problems which we have at work or perhaps at school. That could be anything else. These typical questions, why and how long? And it is very interesting what Habakkuk did. He came with these questions to God. And he asked God, why and how long? And God gave an answer. And the answer which God gave, that is also typical for our daily life. It is not in that way as we can read it sometimes in Christian books or in reports or wherever else, that I pray to God and ten minutes later I have the answer. God is, not, God is not something like a machine. You put a prayer in it and you get the exact answer which you want to get. So he asked these two questions, why and how long? And again, I think we all have sometimes these questions in our daily life. And what did God say? And I think nobody of us would get this answer. Because God said in chapter 1, I know all of these problems. And if you want to get an answer, I will give you an answer. The situation will become worse. I think that is not an answer that somebody of us wants to get if he prays to God. But that is sometimes the daily life. If you have problems at work, you pray to God, and the situation would not become better. Perhaps you have problems under the believers, you pray to God, and the situation didn't become better. Or somebody is ill and he prays to God. Yeah. God is not a person who changed immediately everything. He can do it, of course. But very often the situation um, becomes worse. And that is the situation which we have here in the prophet Habakkuk. And that, again, is very often the situation in my daily life. And what do I do now? And that is very interesting what Habakkuk did. I don't want to say so much about this prophet. We have no time for that. But here we have no, no acting. Here we have a dialogue between the prophet and God. But there is one acting, and that is in chapter 2 in the first verses. And that was the reason why I read these verses. Because Habakkuk changed his position. He changed his view. That doesn't mean that the circumstances changed, are changing. But what changed 
is the heart of Habakkuk. So at first he changed the position, and we read in verse 1, I will stand upon my watch. And that is a very interesting word. We find it not very often in Scripture, but I can read one, one verse that we find it. I must read it because I can't quote it in English. It's First Samuel 22, I think, the last verse. Yes, chapter 22, verse 33, there the same Hebrew word is translated for this, me thou art in safe keeping. So the meaning of this word is in safe keeping. So that shows me that Habakkuk changed his position. And he didn't look any more on the circumstances in which he was. But he changed his position and he looked unto God. He went into the presence of God. He went to somebody from whom he knew that he is there in safe keeping. So that is the first solution which the Holy Spirit shows us here. What can we do if we have problems like this? That the answer of God is things become worse. Are we disappointed? Perhaps at first we are disappointed. Are we angry of God? Sometimes it could be that we are this. Do we understand the ways of God? I think sometimes we don't understand the ways of God. There is another prophet who didn't understand the ways of God, and that is the prophet Jeremiah. I don't know if I find this now in the English Bible. It must be in the 20th, perhaps. Okay, it's not so important, uh, but he has difficulties to understand the ways of God. And he asks God, why must I go this way? Are you really righteous that I have to go this way? And then God answered him, I put the beloved in the hand of my enemies. And the beloved, of course, it is a picture of the Lord Jesus. But at first, it is not a picture of the Lord Jesus. At first, it is the picture of the people of God. At first, it is a picture of a believer of the people of God. So God not says, I know the problems in which a believer is, but he is in my eyes somebody who I love. He is the beloved. Of course, we can also put it on the Lord Jesus, but at first, it speaks from the people of God. So he changed his position and he went to this place, and I think that is very important, which is a keep safe, 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 safe a place in his eyes. So he was in the presence of God. He stood upon the tower and then he looked forth to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer as to my reproof. So it was a critical situation now, because Habakkuk wanted to discuss with God about his ways. But God didn't want to discuss with Habakkuk, because God knew that could be not very good for Habakkuk. And so he didn't speak to him. He, show, he, he, he shew him a vision. And this vision is very interesting, and I want to say only a couple of words about this vision. Because the content of this vision is the very interesting expression, though it tarry, wait for it, for it will surely come, it will, it will not delay. So the vision is a person. It is not so easy to understand this if we have only this verse. 
But this verse is quoted in the epistle to the Hebrews. And if you read this verse in the epistle of he to the Hebrews, you will see that the Holy Spirit changed one word. He changed the word it into he. So the content of the vision is a person, he will surely come. So the name of this per person in this vision is he will come. So what did God do in the situation of Habakkuk? In this, I would say, very difficult situation, he brought his son. That is the answer which God gave in the situation of Habakkuk. He didn't change the circumstances. The enemies will come. They are described in Habakkuk 1. And they are terrible people who God will send to judge his people. He will not change anything from the circumstances. But he put his son in the daily life of Habakkuk. And it is very interesting that we have this name a couple of times in the Old and New Testament. One example is Psalm 118. There we also have this name. It must be at the end of this psalm. Verse 26. Blessed be he that comes in the name of Jehovah. So here again we find the name of this person. The name is he will come. And there is one man in the New Testament who used this name twice. And that is John the Baptist. And we find it in Matthew. And it's easy to keep it in your mind because it's Matthew 3 verse 11. And 11 verse 3. I hope so. Yes. Matthew 3 verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water to repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I. Whose sandals I am not fit to bear. So the only name of the Lord Jesus in this verse is he that comes. Comes. And again, when, Bapt when John the Baptist was in prison, he sent his disciples to the Lord Jesus in Matthew 11, verse 3, and they have only one name for the Lord Jesus. Although the coming one, so that shows us, and again we have the quotation, I think it's Hebrews 10 or 12, where this verse is quoted, it, so that it is absolutely clear, here we have the name of the Lord Jesus. So in this situation, God put his son in the situation of Habakkuk. And he says another very important, uh, not, no, no, he didn't say a word, but there is a very interesting reaction in verse 2, that he may run, that reads it. It is not so easy to understand. It could, the meaning could be that um, Habakkuk wrote this vision with very big letters on a piece of wood or on a clay tablet, I don't know. So that everybody who is passing very fast is able to read it. That could be one explanation of this Hebrew expression which you find in Habakkuk 2. But I think that is not the right one. I think there is a much more important interpretation, and that is when somebody reads this vision, he begins to run to put his life in the presence of God, to bring everything uh, in, the, in the thoughts of God which, is not in the, which was not in the thoughts of God before. So this vision has an influence uh, on the hearts of the people who saw this so that they can change or that they have to change their life and they have to do it very fast because the judgment stood in front of the door. 
What is the result in the life of Habakkuk after he got this very interesting vision? After God put his son in the situation of the life of Habakkuk, and I want to close with this verse in Habakkuk 3, that is very interesting because there we see that, that the situation become worse. It, it, it becomes terrible. In verse 16, I heard and my belly trembled. My, lip, my, my lips quivered at the voice. Rottenness entered into my bones. And I trembled in my place. These are verses who show uh, the hopeless. But what is the situation in the heart of Habakkuk? That I might rest in the day of distress. You see, we have the prayer of Habakkuk. Why and how long? And we have the answer of God. Things become worse. But the position of Habakkuk changed. He put his face and his heart into the direction of God. And then God put his son into his life. The circumstances are the same. But then we read this wonderful word, I might rest in the day of distress. So that shows us how God is acting in our daily life. That gives us an example how our high priest is acting in our daily life. He, he did everything in this book that Habakkuk didn't sin. Habakkuk wanted to discuss, but God didn't want to do this. Habakkuk had these big problems, and God put his son into his life. Unbelievers can't understand this. There's a nice verse in the book of Job that unbelievers have no chance in this situation um, to be quiet. Because in Habakkuk, no, 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 in, in Job, I think 35, yes, verse 10, th there we have the, the, the heart of unbelievers, but none says, where is God my maker? who gives songs in the night. But we, as the believers, we can say, we have a God, a God who gives songs in the night. Also, if the situation is very difficult, perhaps if we have illness since a couple of years or decades, and there is no hope, but it is possible that believers have um, songs in the night not of their own power, but because they are connected with this person yeah, who went his way on this earth and who is now glorified and sitting on the right hand of God. He will not change all our circumstances. That is not what the epistle to the Hebrews is teaching us. But he will give us a quiet heart. And he will come in our circumstances by himself. So we have not to go our way for ourselves. The Lord Jesus is going with us. like to follow up a little bit on what uh, our brother Stefan brought before us regarding Habakkuk. Indeed, a remarkable book, the book of Habakkuk. And it's also remarkable how it relates to what we have seen in our studies, in particular also today. 
And this book was a book which was dear also to the heart of the Apostle Paul. Our brother mentioned that he is quoting in particular the verse in chapter 2, that the just shall live by his faith. That was part of the answer which God had given to Habakkuk in his circumstances. And we know that this verse is quoted in Romans chapter 1, in Galatians chapter 3, and in Hebrews chapter 10, always with a slightly different emphasis. But a very important answer which God indeed gave to Habakkuk. He had to change position. And we see this transformation which is really taking place in the heart of this man. He is wrestling with God regarding the questions he has. His name means wrestler or wrestling. And we see the deep questions he has. He brings them to God. He's in a, yeah, his soul is in trouble, we could say, at the beginning of the book. And so he speaks up and just presents what is on his heart to God. And we see very clearly that he has to calm down. And it's wonderful how God brings him to this point to calm down. The answers, as we heard, were not the ones he expected, in particular not on his first question, regarding the evil which was there in the midst of God's people. Was he looking for revival? Maybe. God had granted to his people revival at other occasions. And he was maybe looking again that God would do such a work in the days in which he was living. Was he looking for another other intervention of God because indeed the people of God deserved judgment. There's no doubt about it regarding their condition. But he comes with his questions. And as we heard, he had to change position to really come up to the watchtower um, as we have seen in chapter 2. And God shows him and I want to insist on this. We do not live as Christians, and Habakkuk had to learn it for his time, by explanations. Oftentimes we want an explanation for a situation on our why questions. And we have to learn to live by faith. To live by faith, not by explanations but by faith taking hold of the promises of God. That is what we need. By faith to lay hold of the promises of God. And we see throughout this book how Habakkuk is getting quiet, calming down. In chapter 3, at the beginning, he says, it's a prayer of Habakkuk there, I, in verse 2, I heard the report of thee, and I feared. And then, Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. It's a really beautiful prayer we can have as well. And yet, the situation didn't become better. We know well that Habakkuk was living roughly the same time as Prophet Jeremiah, and things didn't get better. But it's so beautiful to see how his state of heart is really changing. And Brother Stefan already referred to chapter 3 towards the end. I want to read still with you the following verses there. Chapter 3, 
and verse 17. For thou the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive tree shall fail, and the fields shall yield no food. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. It's really a very sad picture the prophet is painting. No fruit on the trees, and the stalls are empty. If, he, if I may make this, explana this application, many of us are indeed in local gatherings which are not increasing in number, but decreasing. And it can lead to nearly depression sometimes, such situations. But the prophet really says here, even, I prefer to translate like this, even if there is no fruit on the fig tree, even if the stalls are empty, even if the situation looks so desperate, what will he do? And that is verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will join in the God of my salvation. Jehovah, the Lord, is my strength. And he makes my feet like hen's feet. He will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief musician on my stringed instruments. What a beautiful finish of this book. Remarkable. I don't know whether the Apostle Paul was thinking of Habakkuk 3 when he was writing Philippians 3. But it's exactly the same language. Rejoice in the Lord. Even if it's so sad, it looks so desperate, disappointing. I will rejoice in the Lord. Paul in prison there, he rejoiced in the Lord. And he encouraged others to rejoice in the Lord. How wonderful it is. But he has to have the right view. The Lord had to really come into the circumstances, as we heard. And everything changed. And he really is able to rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Apostle Paul, there in prison. And he could rejoice even if others, they were preaching the glad tidings, they had not good motives. They want to cause even trouble to his chains. But he rejoiced the glad tidings are preached. Always a focus on the Lord and taking circumstances, difficult as they were, from the hand of the Lord and see also still what was good and positive. And then verse 19, the Lord is my strength. Here, it seems we are in, in Philippians chapter 4, right? Philippians chapter 4, we read in verse 13, I have strength for all things in him that gives me power. Yes, we see there that living in such a way with the Lord, the focus on the Lord, there is joy in the heart, there is energy there, there is strength to move forward, to pursue towards the mark. And it says, and now I'm back in Philippians 3, towards the mark or the goal for the price of the calling on high of God in Christ Jesus. We go back to Habakkuk chapter 3. He makes my feet like hen's feet. He will make me walk, he will make me to walk on my high places. You see the relation. The calling on high, not just a high calling, but a calling on high, a heavenly calling. This is what we have. A calling on high. 
where our Lord is already. He has called us. And indeed, we want to run the race up to the finish line, which is indeed soon reached. The Lord is coming very soon. And until that moment, let us run the race. But really, having Christ in view, Christ in glory, and run forward, pursue the course towards the mark. The high calling in of God in Christ Jesus. He will make he makes my feet like hen's feet. They are the deers, you know, they jump, yeah? They are hurdles, difficulties. They can really jump like hen's feet. Not pulled down, but like his feet, really running. May the Lord encourage us also through these days of conference we had, that we would really run the race up to the very end. To the chief musician on my stringed instruments, what do you have here? There's a song in the heart. A wrestling prophet at the beginning. All questions he has. And at the end, you see how the, this transformation which took place in him, and now he's able to sing on stringed instruments. That is what God desires as well with us. As we contemplate the Lord Jesus, occupied with the man in the glory, that there is a song in our hearts. And like that, we move forward until his coming. <laughs>